we are in the middle of peak fall foliage season. So here is a lovely picture of what the Ashokan Reservoir of New York City looks like now. So I wanted you to fall in love with it before I mess it all up for you. So every two years, pretty much, the New York Times newspaper runs a new article about how New York City's tap water is the champagne of tap water because it comes directly from the mountain and is pretty much unfiltered, directly there. They do almost nothing to it. And this has infuriated the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. But here's the static website that the New York Times maintains on how New York gets its water. And I want you to pay attention to the depiction here where New York City is definitely this very dense place where people live. And the Ashokan Reservoir is part of the Catskill watershed up there. And the um, aqueduct that connects this reservoir down to the city is depicted as more of a river than the actual Hudson River, which everybody knows is very polluted. Where I live, right about here, we get our water from the Hudson River. We're not good enough for the New York City's water. So they described it this way, the Catskill, Delaware watershed, which extends 125 miles northwest of the city, provides more than 90% of the city's water supply. The rest comes from this ugly gray area known as the Croton watershed, uh, which I'm actually working both here at the Boyd's Corner Reservoir and up here at the Ashokan Reservoir and comparing the two. So after doing about four and a half years of survey of all the New York City owned lands around those two reservoirs, I've come to see uh, New York City's watershed as manufactured rural space that requires three basic things for people to actually accept it as rural space. You have to first dismiss the past urban nature of that beautiful scenic area. You have to deny that there were land use impacts in both the past and the present in these areas. And you have to have the city somehow enforcing land use rules to keep it looking and seeming like a natural place. So if you drive around that beautiful Ashokan Reservoir, you will see all of these signs that tell you almost nothing except something happened here. And New York City doesn't actually take ownership of the fact that they're the ones who did some of this. So if we go back, first we see these two arrows here. If we go back one, oops, go back two, go back one, this sign is at that green arrow on the next sign. So if you're looking at the beautiful Ashokan Reservoir, it's nicely labeled, this is New York City's land, you're not allowed on this land, even though it's 85 miles. This sign is 85 miles from New York City. And New York City employs its own police force in these rural areas that are Department of Environmental Protection Police, DEP police, who walk around sometimes with machine guns and have threatened to arrest me in my work here. And they have all these cool vehicles, like they got a boat, they got all these fancy things that is very colonial and very intimidating at the same time. They can't intimidate me, they don't know what they're messing with. All right, so <laughs> I want to point out a couple of uh, town names that we're going to come up a little bit. So Olive, which is redundant in all of these different places that there's Olive Branch, Olive City, Olive Bridge, Olive, and the reservoir in this area is in the town of Olive now, so it's very confusing. Um, there's Boyceville, there's Shokan, and I specifically want you to remember the town of West Shokan. So this is what the area looked like in the 1905 topo map, and as I was pointing out over there, please look at the, the carpet. It's the topo map. I think they, they copied it. Um, and this is what it looked like before New York City started their reservoir. And here you have Broadhead, Chopin, Olive, Olive Bridge, and this Ulster and Delaware Railroad that is the heart of this valley, these communities. So where would you put a reservoir if you were in New York City looking at that map? Oh, there's a nice little like, flat space here, maybe a flat space here. No, let's put it, bam, right on top of everything. Darn it. So this is the 1915 uh, overlay of the reservoir on that map. And I think an important thing for uh, historical and contemporary archaeologists is to be very critical of these ideas that we have inherited and sometimes just accept. So I'm not picking on Ben Ford here. This is just one of the most recent articles that uses what I'm calling uh, the myth of the dying New England farmsteads. And we're at the most western extreme of New England in New York there. But Ben's used here two um, local history sources from the 1800s to help support the idea 
as New York City proclaims this, that those people who lost their homes and their businesses and their way of life are better off. So what Ben says here, just paraphrasing a bit, the small family owned, operated, the small family operated New England farmsteads were simply unable to compete. They had marginal tracts of land, they had denudation of the region, competition from the new Midwest farms. So all those people moved west or they entered the urban working class and that's why there are abandoned farms all over New England and New York. And I want to complicate that and be much more critical of how better off were these people. So if you do the research into that area, you see that starting in the 1870s, this area was the playground of New York City residents, especially the rich people. They would come up the Hudson River on ferries they would stay on the river at huge hotels like that, and they would await transport by coach or by railroad, that railroad that got demolished for the reservoir, into places like Olive Branch, Broadhead, Chopin. Mind you, some of these are in the wrong order. But these come from the summer excursion brochure with rates and routes from 1884. So this area was being exploited for tourism over 100 years ago, and the farms were part of the ideal that these people were buying into to come there. It wasn't that these farmers were just trying to subsist on rocky soil and they were better off to be forced out. They were doing their agriculture as part of this tourism. So of these, I'm very lucky that the Ashokan Reservoir was constructed right during the postcard craze in the United States. And these guys all here are things that were destroyed to create that reservoir. The only thing that wasn't destroyed is Moon Hall, which we'll come back to later. These houses here, here, and here, if these were still standing in New York City today in the, in the uh, watershed area, they would sell for over a million dollars. These aren't backwards people who are struggling to make a living. This is what we would call in New York suburban way of life. Bishop Falls here, their tourist destination that's always written up in these brochures, it was where they decided to put the dam for New York City. There's the Shokan Railroad Station. So there, this place wasn't all that rural. And it wasn't just farms. There were lots of dairy farms, so here's Boyceville, and we find in our surveys a milk can up there. And the properties outside of those were hayfields for that dairy. But we also had industry, like the postcard up here is the uh, Hudson River Wood Pulp Manufacturing Company that in, in 1900, before the reservoir went in, was producing a quarter of a million cubic feet of wood pulp for dynamite. And we have one postcard that says, this is the picture of where I work. I have another postcard that says, I assume this will be gone when the, when the reservoir comes in. So these aren't farmers who are farming and better off to be pushed out. This was a whole way of life that was very tied to New York City. So we covered the dismissal of the past urban nature. This history is something that most people don't know. And we'll quickly go through the denial of past and present land use impacts to make this a rural place. So in 1909, the reservoir was under construction. And this guy, William Henry Welser, writes his master's thesis in civil engineering on the problem of putting a reservoir in a place like this. And he says up here, his general statement of the problem is that there, there's so much sewage that is going into that area from all the, he says, the principal industry of the region is borders, great numbers of which come from New York City, and all of their sewage drains right into the creeks, which goes right into where New York City is building their reservoir. So they were very aware, even when building the reservoir, that this is not a natural place and that tourism and pollution go together. So this is, again, the carpet. This is uh, the first map that actually shows the reservoir. So this is from 1915, and the red dots are from the 1968 topographic map. So there's two time periods represented here. But I want you to focus in on the red dots here that so many people after the reservoir is constructed start moving into this area because New York City <coughs> puts a highway, the New York State Thruway, that replaces the ferries for tourism. And people start building second homes and vacation homes in these areas. And all of this has all of these creeks that drains right into the Ashokan Reservoir. So there was this next flurry of concern over the pollution of this reservoir. So New York City has been buying up all the land they can around these areas and 
creating a second wave of depopulation to create this ideal that their water is the champagne of tap water. The purple are areas that the city currently owns, some of these they've owned since the reservoir was put in. The two different shades of green are two different levels of priority. So if you live in these areas, they call you twice a year and offer you market value for your land. So it is an active depopulation uh, procedure that's going on. And I'm gonna focus on just what is on this property here, the Acorn Hill property. So if you look at it from the satellite view, it's a nice rural landscape. Look at all those trees, isn't it beautiful? If you look at it on the LIDAR, you see how scarred it is from its past uses. Here's the quarry that was the quarry site for creating the dam that dammed the Asopus Creek to create the reservoir. And that railroad system was created to bring the stone to that uh, dam site. And then you have all the stone walls from all the fields, they're everywhere. The more you look at it, the more you see, that are part of these um, past tourism uh, sites to help feed that boarding industry. So this is what it looks like on the ground. Uh, this is rather large. If I was standing right there, this would come up to my shoulders. And of course, I'm not very large myself. So you'll have to talk to me afterwards to figure that out, uh, how large this is. But the, the landscape is scarred, but very few people who live in that area even know this exists because the forest is so dense, it's hard to get through. You have to knock trees over to get through it. But the forests are artifacts here because New York City planted millions of trees in this area to protect the water. The other part of this Yale quarry here is this is where the railroad cars, this is the railroad bed, the cars would come in here, the crusher is up here, and it would gravity feed into the car, and that's where they would load the stuff. And here is a postcard that shows the railroad that connected Acorn Hill to the dam site. So you can see it's a very significant thing that was there that the local people have forgotten about. And these other postcards are actually the quarry site and the interbetweens and the dam site. So you could see what an impact on the landscape they had. Lots of people see those former site of signs, the former site of Boyceville, the former site of West Chocan, and they think that if you go scuba diving, you could see the buildings. And if you take a look at you see there is nothing left. They dug down to bedrock. So if you wander around even more on Acorn Hill, you can see this is the total remains of a car. Uh, here you have 55 gallon drums, and then you have things that are much more recent than the reservoir, this washing machine. But I think all of these things are tied to the fact that the city owns this landscape, and they don't clean it up. It's environmental protection land, but there is industrial waste on it at the same time, and local people are dumping on it like crazy. So the last thing to cover is the enforcement of city land use rules, and this is where the city is having the hardest time, which I think is why they're so aggressive when they encounter people. All over all of the watersheds, there is a confusing mixture of signs that tell you what you are and are not allowed to do, and no real interpretation of why. But as you can see, the local people represent their conflict with the city. This sign was torn down, folded in half, and left on the ground. Most of, in the Croton Reservoir, that gray area, uh, most of their no hunting signs are shot full of bullet holes. So landscape of conflict, very much, but not something that people generally understand. So putting all of this together, uh, people usually ask me, what's the best artifact you found? In the woods, a coffee mug that says, I think I'm allergic to mornings with coffee stains on the sides. Uh, coffee will be in an hour. Please hold on. Um, so this rural area is designed for supporting the distant urbanity and by selling rurality at the same time because the people who live there are mostly these richer people. So remember Moonhaw? This is what Moonhaw looks like today. If you focus on this bridge and these stairs, it's the same bridge and same stairs. And I want you to think about, it's so easy to say this is a gentrified landscape, but I think it's always been gentrified. The postcard from Moonhaw from 1905 has a little slogan at the bottom here that I've copied here. It seems to me I'd like to go where bells don't ring, nor whistles blow, nor clocks don't strike, nor gongs don't sound, and I'd have stillness all around. And compare that to the real estate ad for your $3 million rural estate here. It's only a 90 mile drive from the center of Manhattan to a complete oasis of calm and serenity. Everybody wants to go now. Um, as you pass through the iron gates, which you always need in rural, calm, serene areas, uh, you make your way to the driveway and cross over the cobblestone bridge. Uh, you have 
you've come to Twin Creek, so they've renamed it, and it pays homage to comfort and grandeur. And you have to take note of the refinement, especially the natural materials used throughout, which includes reclaimed timbers from Alaska. How much of a carbon footprint is that? But I think I have similar things going on on older sites that seem like just dumps. These tiles, these Mitten Hollands soap upon Trent tiles are in the woods for um, some of these properties that I'm surveying. So I've been trying to figure out where are the places that archaeologists have found these tiles. And one of the places is the Old Divinity School in Cambridge. Apparently they're also used in King's Cross Station in London. What are these doing out in the woods around a reservoir if it wasn't that it was imported for this idea just like reclaimed Alaskan timbers? That we have these exotic things for your comfort and grandeur going on here. So maybe gentrification has always been going on in this area. So to summarize, I think this, the thing that stays the same in the Ashokan area is that the rural place is an urban commodity. And you can classify each kind of era here as going through that in the 1880s, this was a landscape of production. It wasn't natural wilderness back then. In the 1910s, it's a landscape of ruination because those houses, those boarding houses that I showed you pictures of, those people got a notice, 30 days to leave your house, and if you, we will give you half the market value for it as New York City. If you want more money, you can burn down your own house and we'll give you more. By the way, if you have any family members in the cemetery, we will pay you to dig them up and move them. We'll pay you extra if you take the tombstone with you, and that wasn't enough for them to rebury their family members in the same area. So it was definitely this very dramatic impact of this outside influence for that landscape of ruination. And then in the 1920s, these people who were left behind, the people who didn't lose their land, had no help with reorganizing their lives. So in some ways, you were better off that the people pushed you out because you at least got something. In the 1960s, because of the construction of a highway linking this area to New York City, it becomes a landscape of subdivisions, and that leads to new pollution concerns and now the people who can afford to stay and resist the offers of their land value are the richer people. So you're getting more places like Moonha on top of these older sites. So lots of times when I give this talk or a version of this talk in New York, people say, well, what do you want to happen? So what I want to happen is this to be much more honest. So let's look at the more honest version of this. Ooh, <laughs> buildings, especially in that Croton watershed. Uh, and again, I'm living somewhere around there. And to rewrite this, that is something that people could use as information and not a fairy tale. So protecting water means creating rural places in the way that New York City does it as far as not recycling, not chemically treating it. And say something like the original construction of the watershed up to 125 miles north of the city required demolition of approximately 20 villages inhabited by 5,000 people. More than 8,000 bodies had to be removed from their cemeteries. After reservoir construction, many people moved in for the scenic beauty, but ongoing land purchases are encouraging abandonment of those properties. Those who continue to live there are police to ensure that water serves the city, and city residents have treated these distant places as their own since the mid-1800s. So I'll leave you with one last postcard. This is dated July 1906 from another West Show Can boarding house. There's a woman there and a man there. And the message is, I'm sure you have forgotten this place. So I like to bring the ghosts of these people back into here with us. That for, for right now, we have not forgotten them. Thank you.